Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to our series on Judaism and the environment. I'm back with my cousin Michael Kalati. And uh, Michael, uh, we, we've done three episodes so far. And we've covered all sorts of wide-ranging topics to do with the environment. And in your honest opinion, do you feel... I hope this isn't too throwing the, a really complicated question on you to start with, but do you feel that us as a Jewish people that we're doing enough to embrace uh, the the guidelines that you you've uh, set uh, forward you, you've, you've mentioned in the last three episodes? Do, you, do are we really towing the line here? Well, I, difficult question to answer because it's such a complicated uh, issue. Um, there's so many factors and a lot of factors are out of our control mm. are, are, are we acting correctly look if, if we are deemed to be a light unto the nations perhaps we should be the ones um, to, sh to show example you know the concept of a schmitter year is a, is a beautiful concept to let the ground become fallow it seems that's what it wants to do it needs to breathe itself it needs to mm. rest it's a, the, it's being overused so there are there will we have in our artillery the kind of weapons needed to mm -hmm. combat uh, environmental issues but whether we um, whether we you know actually perform them is something else and the last time that the, the Schmitter year was observed was 1994-95 mm. it's a long time ago uh, so yes but also you must look to the future and uh, because of environmental um, you know, environmental worries that we have regarding the climate and floodings and excess heat and what we do about CO2, I'm sure it'll fall upon intelligent minds to be innovative about ways to, you know, what the, how they call sequester, which is to pull, drag down CO2 from the atmosphere. It'll require some clever people. And one thing we have is a lot of clever people amongst, you know, ourselves. So hopefully... Um, maybe Hashem will grant us some sort of um, intelligence to combat even though it's our mm. mess we made up you know we, we, we must pray to Hashem for guidance in how to tackle a problem that we have created so right. yeah so right. I, I think we have, we have a so there, there are experts out there who, who, who you know within the scientific world who, who are showing us the way forward but at the end of the day that I'm sure you'll agree we have to do our Hishtadlut and it's up to Hashem to do the rest but the issue is is I, I think I think you'd agree that we have to be up to speed when it comes to doing this Look, we, we effort have, we have to accept our position what we've done and we have to be prepared to uh, for, for hard you know uncomfortable times and cleaning up our mess mm. you know it's, we're sitting here, it's October 2020, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and pandemics has caused a, a complete reversal of life. We've gone from being a very active society to being basically told by God, go to your room. You know, it's like that. But what, what can we take from that? We noticed that in the pandemic, we've adapted to a completely new way of life, and almost we feel like we can't go back to the old way so one thing mm. we should bear in mind is that change is not impossible and change is not always that difficult so what is required of the population on earth is to is to um, adopt a new uh, mindset and intentions regarding where we where we are now and where we want to be uh, regarding the environment and understand that it's not going to it's not going to kill us to change our ways but realize that we do have to commit to change if we want to see things change for us and our children and future generations it's we have to shame. take on the baton and yeah. go for it yes yes incredible because phrases like the new normal uh, are becoming like buzzwords now you know people are uh, being forced to adapt to change from from previous preconceptions, which we t we took for, let's face it, we took them for granted. Absolutely. Uh, the fact that we go on holidays, the fact that we uh, uh, we have certain business practices that that we adopt, and we and we t we tended to trust in these things. 
perhaps uh, well, I would like to venture to say that um, Hashem says maybe don't trust in these things do you trust in me and I'm telling you I gave you a world and I, I, I want you I want you to look after that world like you said you use the phrase pass the baton so if Hashem gave us the world we need to pass the baton to the next generation and what how would we feel if we passed on a gift that was given to us or maybe our fathers gave to us and then we pass it on tattered and and, and, and torn and abused so uh, I think what you're suggesting are, are a very uh, um, relatively minor steps that, that anybody can take really you know Absolutely. small measures we can do yeah. that, that, that we can implement relatively easily and in that we can just show Hakara to Tov to Hashem for putting us in this position in, in this world um, that we can we can serve to better uh, to better the environment that we can feel confident to pass it down to the next generation and say to them look I, I, I I didn't completely destroy it, and you know, exactly. here you go, make the best of it. So we should be positive that um, all is not lost. Mm. We haven't reached the point of no return, but we're very close. Yeah. So listen, be honoured that we are able to reverse this damage, or at least start the process. Yes, bezrat Hashem. Bezrat Hashem. Okay. So, so today I wanted to talk about um, a couple of things: uh, uh, Noah and the flood in the first section. In the second section I'd like to talk about trees and the uh, dinim uh, surrounding the concept of cities and Levitical cities and the boundaries and the green belt so to speak. Mm. Um, so yeah, so uh, we read in the Torah portion of Noah uh, details of a terrible ecological disaster and a flood that uh, immerses the world in water and basically brings an end to all life all because of the way humankind was uh, behaving um, no one may have been the first environmental activist you know mm. of, uh, he, he acted upon a, a, a commandment from Hashem to keep every species of animals safe on his ark um, and but the, 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 the Torah story ends with an eternal covenant between Hashem and humanity in which we are promised that the land will never be destroyed again at the hands of Hashem. Um, today, in current climate, we are once again experiencing widespread destruction of the planet, this time not as divine punishment, but as a direct result of human actions. There's no doubt that the CO2 levels, the spikes that we're seeing, all started to spike at the beginning or just after the Industrial Revolution mm. the last 250 years. It's clear and obvious if you look at any graph to show CO2 levels that they were all bubbling along nicely and then suddenly whoosh they go up when we started to use fossil fuels. So to, to, to ignore this is, is, uh, is, uh, is silly. Mm. But what can we uh, what is the connection between our generation and the generation of Noah? What, what can we learn from Noah's story? And um, how can we, you know, they talk about a, a flood in, uh, in the future. Um, w w can we prevent this flood? What is this flood? Is this flood, will this flood be a good or bad thing? Will this flood perhaps be a good thing where it's a flood of, perhaps in my opinion, maybe human consciousness of, of suddenly realizing a moment of reality where we realize, a moment of clarity, to actually uh, realize that uh, we have to look after the planet and look after each other and that, um, and that it will be a flood of consciousness that envelops the world rather wow. than a destructive uh, flood of water. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. So you see, you, you're giving like a positive spin on the idea of mubble. So it's a present day mubble but it's, it's, it, it's a positive... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So the story of the flood begins with a description of the evil that fell upon the earth. As it says in Bereshus chapter 6 verse 11, and the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Uh, Rashi explains that the word violence refers to stealing. So if he says this, what, what, what is it, what, is, what, what do people steal in order to bring such a serious punishment upon themselves? 
in uh, an idea was presented in the Midrashic anthology Yalkut Shimoni uh, is that the generation of the flood committed the sin of hubris which is intense pride before nature uh, believing that they were masters and um, and believing they were masters of the order of the world the uh, the Dar HaFlaga, the generation that built the Tower of Babel after the flood is described as the generation that revealed how to control nature and its resources. With the help of technological developments and other means, the people of that generation reached a state in which they felt that they were without fear before the strengths of nature and no longer relied on God's intervention. The Midrash in Sanhedrin, chapter 108, verse 2, further emphasizes this point, describing the reactions of the people upon seeing Noah building the ark. Um, the, the generation of Noah said, if a flood of water should come from the lands, uh, that they would just reinforce the land with poles of steel, uh, and a flood of fire would not have scared them. They've, they've, they felt so perfected that they had no reason to fear anything. They felt prepared for any kind of natural disaster. Uh, the ability to act from within nature brings the generation of the flood to heightened pride before the world and before Hashem. This pride brings them to stealing, perhaps by stealing the world's resources. Mm-hmm. All these together led to the inevitable consequence, um, the mabul, the flood that destroyed the world. Therefore, Noah acted, you know, he, uh, he, he, he took action. You know, in the in the arrogant and violent world of the generation of the floods, Noah was chosen to to save and perpetuate a life on Earth. But why was Noah chosen to survive, and while the rest of humanity completely decimated? The Torah says that Noah found favor in the eyes of God, but it's not really clear why Noah and his family were saved from disaster while others were not. Still, he was he he was saved. And following God's commandment, he placed into his ark all the types of animals and all the species in the world, and he cared for them for an entire year. Um, Our Banim described Noah's difficult work in detail. In um, according to the Midrash Tanchuma, the um, the holy work done through selfishness and kindness. Through those twelve months, Noah and his sons did not sleep because they had to feed the animals, beasts, and birds says in Midrash Tanchuma. The Talmud also explains that the ark had three levels, um, one for Noah and his family, one for animals and one for animals' waste, um, revealing how much energy he really put into looking after them. You know, some, also some, uh, some legends say that Noah endangered his life and was even wounded when he fed um, the lions. Mm. According to Rashi, Noah worked so hard that he would groan and grow faint the burden of the uh, of the animals that he was uh, charged to look after. Mm. Um, Noah's concern extended beyond the animals of the world. He also considered the continuity of plant life, bringing with him onto the ark, as it says in Midrash Rabbah, Noah chapter 1 verse 14, good mm. things to plant, fig shoots and olive saplings. Clearly Noah was the earliest known case of nature preservation and he went out of his way to save both animals and plants. But there was only one species that Noah didn't save, and that was humans. Mm. That's very interesting. The Zohar uh, relates the following story. When Noah left the ark after having seen the world destroyed, he began to cry before Hashem, and he said, uh, you are called compassionate. You, you should have been compassionate for your creation. And Hashem responded and said, You are a foolish shepherd. Now you say this. Why did you not say this to me at the time I told you that I saw that you were righteous among your generation? Or afterwards, I said that I will bring a flood upon the people. Or afterwards, when I said to build an ark. I constantly delayed and I said, when is Noah going to ask for compassion for the world? And now that the world is destroyed, you open your mouth to cry in front of me and to ask for supplication? This is from Zohar. Hashmatot of Boratius uh, 254b. Um, we'll never know why Noah didn't fight to evoke the evil decree and spare the world from destruction. 
maybe in his heart he believed that the world um, was so depraved that it wasn't mm -hmm. suitable for redemption. Only as he considered the innocent animals were meant to survive. Or maybe he thought that um, the essence of that generation would, would rub off on him and he would also be destined for destruction. Uh, in this sense, Noah essentially was living in his own ark even before the flood and didn't mm. feel a connection or responsibility to the world that was to be decimated. It's impossible to know what stopped Noah from requesting Hashem's help, but we do know that his descendants, Avraham, didn't suffer the same complacency regarding his fellow human beings. Um, it was ten generations later we see Avraham pleading with God to exercise mercy on the people of Sodom. Um, Avraham opened his eyes to the plight of the innocents and attempts to intercede on their behalf. So after the flood, after the waters receded from the earth, um, Noah made a sacrifice to Hashem and who upon smelling and pleasing and the pleasing sense made a fundamental decision. I will not again, and I quote this from Boratius chapter 8 verses 21 to 22, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And he made an eternal covenant with Noah and the inhabitants of the of the uh, of the ark. In Boratius chapter nine verses eight to seventeen, Hashem says, "And God spoke unto Noah, and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is lived with you, the fowl, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark." even every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And Hashem continues, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the cloud that I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall be no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. That is Genesis chapter 9 verses 8 to 17. So what can we learn from this? You know, today we're experiencing an ecological crisis that is categorized by phenomena such as glacial melting, extended droughts, accelerated species migration and extinction and widespread disease. Most of these problems originate from the unchecked utilization of natural resources by humans and the creation of excess weight and waste and pollution. In many cases, it may be argued that the entire ecological crisis is a direct result of the very societal ills found in the generations of Noah. Uh, and the land was filled with violence, as it was said. Um, you know, the story doesn't need to repeat itself. We are all children of Noah, but we are also children of, of Avram. Um, from Noah, we receive the ability to exercise responsibility for nature and the biodiversity of species, and the willingness to work hard to retain and repair our world. Unfortunately, as we, we are, we, just, we also resemble Noah in our ability to separate ourselves from others so that our righteousness should not be blemished. It is easy to stay secluded at home, ignoring problems of the world. A, a bigger challenge is to face the world and embrace its needs as our own. And so finally, we should see ourselves as children of Abraham, who calls upon us to be an integral part of the world to sit in the opening of the tent and invite everybody to join in a life of faith, in good and love of our fellow people and the willingness to fight for justice. That's amazing, fantastic, wonderful exposition and, and a really fitting way. So 
I think with that we'll we'll, we'll finish today. So um, ne- next week, what are we going to? Well, well, well yeah. if, perhaps next week we'll continue with trees, which was the second section. I think we mm. we'll save that for next week and um, look forward to delivering that then. Yeah, fantastic! Thank you so much, Michael. See you next time. <laughs>